Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. No country matters more to our security and perhaps to the world's than overcrowded, nuclear-armed, Taliban-touched and, in some senses, paranoid Pakistan. That was true before the Bin Laden killing, and it's true now. And today we're going to concentrate on that remarkable country with the Pakistani novelist Mohsin Hamid, famous for the reluctant fundamentalist. Another novelist, Tamina Anam, who's from Bangladesh and who's going to show us another side of the history of the region. And Francis Fukuyama, famous for the end of history, but whose new book is about the origins of political order and thus why some states work in today's world Others fail, and some are somewhere in between. But we're going to start with Anatole Levin of King's College London, who has written a fascinating new study of Pakistan called simply A Hard Country. Anatole, I have to start by asking you, uh, given your expertise on Pakistan, how far you think the Pakistani authorities knew about bin Laden being there and how intense the sort of mixture of embarrassment and anger subsequently has been. The embarrassment and anger are very intense, although it's a question whether it will actually lead to anything. I mean, if the argument for incompetence is going to have any credibility, um, then the commander of Pakistani intelligence ought to resign. Um, But nobody really thinks that's very likely. As to whether they did know, I would say the balance of probability uh, is that at least some group within Pakistani intelligence did know, yes. That's not certain, of course. Very few things are are certain in Pakistan. That's one reason why it's so paranoid. Um, But I think on balance, yes. The question then becomes whether uh, it was in the hope of using him later as a bargaining counter or much more sinister if there were actually sympathisers. I'd like to come back later on to the nature of the relationship between America and Pakistan and the dangers in all of that. But just before, let's just start by by looking at Pakistan itself because in your book um, you argue that uh, it's clearly in no way a sort of Western-style democratic state. In many ways, the state doesn't exist, barely exists for a lot of people. But that it's also very wrong to regard it as a failing state, that there are sort of fibrous, it's a fibrous toughness in Pakistan that outsiders often don't understand. So just talk us through that a little bit. Yes, fibrous is a good word because it's held together by these networks of clans headed by property-owning feudals, as they're called, or urban bosses. Uh, And who basically exploit the state to redistribute patronage to their kinfolk and their followers. Now, on the one hand, this is really one of the things that gives the the system its toughness in the face of revolution and disintegration. On the other hand, of course, because it's based on plundering the state, it's absolutely terrible for development. You say at one point, I think, that 1% of people in Pakistan pay taxes, for instance. Yes, and it has the lowest rates of tax collection in South Asia, less than 10%. And um, at that point, the state simply does not have the resources uh, to do many of the things that the state needs to do, even before, of course, the resources that it does raise are either plundered by the elites or taken by the army, um, which is another major factor. Which is one of the very rare institutions in Pakistan, in your argument, which does work. At, it, it, at a certain level, anyway. At a certain level, it does work. I mean, it, it but partly because it gets so much money, but it does redistribute the money to its soldiers in an orderly and internally honest fashion. That's why there is this, cons- repeatedly, this idea that the army can take over the state and run it, which is completely false. Um, and again, a lot of um, Westerners would say, well, you know, given the nature of the Taliban in the north of the country and the Pashtan er- pa- uh, Pathan areas of the country, and given all these madrasas, this is clear clearly a country which is going to fall to Islamist extremism. And again, in your book, you argue that is a profound misreading. I, well, I certainly hope so, <laughs> from, from every point of view. Yes. Um, not just that I hope my analysis was right. Uh, but one of the things about Pakistan is, unlike Iran, say, it is a very, very varied country, including from the religious aspect. There are several different kinds of Islam in Pakistan. This then also cuts across the many different ethnicities of Pakistan. And as a Lahori friend um, said to me during my researches, one of the reasons why we Pakistanis could never agree on an Islamist revolution is that we can't agree on anything. Mm, mm. 
Um, most in, 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 in your novels, um, including Moth Smoke, which you wrote relatively early on, um, you describe um, from the inside, it seemed to me, a lot of the world that Anatole is looking at as a journalist and a historian, the notion of incredible importance of kinship groups and knowing somebody and, and actually a country in which you are protected and helped by family and almost not at all by the state. I think that's right. Um, when the floods came last year to Pakistan, for example, uh, the state response was, was minimal. But virtually everyone I knew volunteered time, money, went out there, donated. And I'm talking about from uh, the poorest people in the market to very wealthy people. And they were helping the villages that they came from, uh, fan, friends, family, etc. There is a very powerful social safety net in the form of these patronage networks that exist in Pakistan. In your novels also, um, I was perhaps rude by saying that there's a, an element of, of Pakistani paranoia about the world, but certainly Pakistan feels surrounded by uh, enemies, and there's a lot of discussion about India among some of your, in, by some of your characters and the Indian nuclear bomb and the Pakistani nuclear bomb. But also you discuss the war with Bangladesh and the incredible importance of that to the sort of Pakistani um, self-image. Well, I think um, the 1971 uh, war in in East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh, was uh, well. It was a you know a, a, a terrible genocide and a, and a horrific massacre of people. Um, nothing like that has happened in Pakistan since. It's an unusual event in Pakistani history, but it does it does represent um, uh, a kind of. Uh, uh, turning on itself of which Pakistan and Pakistanis are capable and it comes from a kind of paranoia um, I, I wouldn't disagree with the idea of paranoia I think there is uh, a deeply entrenched double think in Pakistan Tamima, um, in, in your book The Good Muslim, um, another novel but seen from the Bangladeshi side um, of the divide um, one of the things that occurred to me is, is, is the sheer madness um, in 1940. 6, 1947, 1948, yeah. of thinking that you could create one country of two such disparate places merely because they both happen to be Muslim-dominated. Exactly. It seems inevitable that East and West Pakistan would break up eventually, and perhaps it needn't have happened in such a bloody, horrific way. But, um, you know, the idea of having these countries that are separated, it would be like, you know, having France and Greece decide that they're one country and, and forgetting about all, all, of the, all of the countries in the middle. Um, but the thing is that in a way, Pakistan wasn't able to integrate a co concept of diversity and pluralism from the very beginning. And perhaps that's why, as you were saying, it's, it's you know, there are many different kinds of people in Pakistan, but is there an idea of the nation that brings that all together? Tamima, in, in your book, one of the characters, the brother of the narrator, um, is turned more and more towards a pretty extreme form of Islam or Islamism because of his experiences in the war. And I wondered whether we thought there is a sort of, there is a wider point here, that the experience of being surrounded and struggling for some sense of identity does or can very easily drive people towards Islamism um, as an alternative to traditional nationalism. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's possible that the trauma of the war or a trauma in other forms can drive people or a sense of a sense of feeling surrounded by hostile others. Um, I, I suppose in the case of Bangladesh, that hasn't happened on a national scale because we have a concept of our Bengali ethnicity and language, um, and, and that sort of identity has remained primary, and that's what's kept Bangladesh possibly from turning the way of Pakistan. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, I was... Uh, reading your new book on the origins of political order, which is part one of a, 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 an even bigger work, um, at the same time as Anatole Levin's History of Pakistan. And I kept thinking, yes, 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 because you describe um, the origins of political order as being very much about lineage-based, clan-based, family-based authority, which only uh, in certain circumstances then develops into a full-blown state. And I wondered, we call... Pakistan, we call lots of countries around the world, including some in Europe, we call them states and countries, as if that answered everything. But actually, just below the level of the national flag, there is a much older form of authority across a lot of the world, isn't there? Well, that's absolutely right. The most natural form of human sociability uh, is either based on kinship or based on the direct exchange of favors between friends. Uh, and that's the form that people will revert to in the absence of <clears throat> incentives to do otherwise. Uh, if you look at this, the countries that really did create impersonal modern states, China was one of the first, and it was 
on the basis of a real war against kinship in a certain way because they had to create uh, an institution. That, uh, one of the instruments they used was actually the civil service examination by which you'd recruit people into the state bureaucracy uh, because they're talented and had certain skills in education and not because they're the cousin or the brother-in-law of the present ruler. Uh, the Mamelukes uh, and the Ottomans had the most extreme system for doing this. They'd actually capture uh, slaves in a different part of the world, bring them uh, back and raise them in the household uh, apart from their families. To create a sort of neutral elite which could That's crush right. those tribal and kinship groups, which in Pakistan are still so strong. Uh, which in Pakistan are still strong. In Afghanistan, it's still basically a tribal-level society. And so these are countries that have had, uh, as a result of their contact with the outside world, state-level institutions imposed on top of a society that's still primarily organized uh, uh, on the basis of friends and family and these kinds of personal uh, connections. And at all, even reading your account of Pakistan, I came away thinking, A, I now understand why what we in the West call um, corruption uh, is absolutely essential to day-to-day -day life, just surviving and getting by and ensuring you're getting a job, getting food, getting protection, getting security, because nobody else is going to do it for you. But I also felt, well, there's very little chance of Pakistan developing into a, a, a sort of South Asian version of I don't know, Turkey, n never mind Italy, never mind France, that the development to a, a European-style state is simply not going to happen. Well, one should never say never. Um, Urbanisation may change things over time. Um, it has in other places. Mm. It's doing so very slowly in Pakistan um, because, well, partly because the economy is not really developing in a modern way. So very often, even in the towns, people are still dependent on their families for employment and so forth. But it may change. But one thing I do think is uh, that if urbanisation does cha really change the, the society, it will do so in an Islamist way, very likely. We just have to pray that it's in a Turkish-style Islamist way and not something a lot rougher. Mm. Uh, would you agree with that, Mohsin, in terms of... I mean, the, the, there, are, there are various sort of models, and you can look at Turkey, you can look at Egypt. Who knows what's going to happen in Egypt? But there are plenty of examples of uh, m heavily Muslim-dominated countries which have de developed a more successful form of parliamentary democracy or uh, representative democracy. Well, I think um, Pakistan is, is unusual uh, because it has uh, uh, security has been essential to the state and the, and the way the state has configured itself since independence. Uh, originally, uh, allying itself to the United States against the Soviet Union in the Cold War as a way to leverage America's power against the rival India. Um, and that has continued in different versions ever since. And, and when you develop a uh, sort of mercenary-like uh, security-based political economy, one thing which flows from that is, is is the marketing, so to speak, of the political economy is about delivering insecurity. And in Pakistan now, there is a, a, a deep and pernicious sense of insecurity that has been created and that many constituents want to see continue. I think, I think the potential change is if that insecurity begins to recede, you could see uh, a state building move in very different non-Islamist uh, lines. But at the moment, uh, policies towards Pakistan seem to enhance insecurity as opposed to reduce it. Well, that takes us straight on to the question of the, the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban and what is often called the, the Janus-faced nature of um, the security services and indeed the army um, in Pakistan. Anatol, you write about this at some, some length. So just explain to us a little bit about um, how, in your view, the, the Taliban are seen in Lahore and in the other big cities of Pakistan? Well, I'm sorry to say that the Afghan Taliban are seen overwhelmingly as a basically legitimate resistance force, mm. um, much in the light that the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviets were seen in Pakistan when I was there in the 1980s. Now, that's not to say that most people would like to see the Taliban ruling over them inside yeah. Pakistan, but there is this view... Up in, up in the north, it's a different world and it's appropriate up there. Well, <clears throat> yes, um, that these are Afghans, they have to, the, the right to fight against a foreign occupation of their country. Of course, it's different in the Pashtun areas of Pakistan and especially the tribal areas along the Afghan frontier because those people are basically the same people as in Afghanistan. They're members of the same tribe. So how do the Pakistanis regard Pakistani Taliban? 
Well, that's different because, of course, the Pakistani Taliban are in revolution against Pakistan. They want to mm. overthrow the Pakistani state. Um, they're killing... As well, we just saw last week, absolutely uh, I mean, in in terrible numbers, well, Pakistanis. We, yes, we, we need to remember they're killing far, far more Pakistanis. In, ten in fact, times since nine eleven, you yeah, sorry, you were about to make the well, same point. I was just point. going to say t- ten times more Pakistanis than died in America on nine eleven have been killed as a result of terrorism and insurgency in Pakistan. But the population is very confused, partly because of sort of mm. the paranoia of the culture, but partly because of military propaganda. So there is this widespread belief that the Pakistani Taliban are actually being backed by India, um, which on the one hand inclines people to oppose them, but then feeds into this whole paranoid security state business that Mohsin has mentioned. And so, w- 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 Mohsin, when you describe the, the elites from the inside in Pakistan, talk to us a little bit about the double nature of this, because... Um, in your novels, these are these are people who are in some sense in love with the West, in love with America to a lesser extent, perhaps with Britain, um, whose world is, is is an international world, but at the same time um, remain profoundly Pakistani and patriotic too. Yeah, that's right, but I think I think what you see in in sort of the liberal, uh, what you might call the liberal elite in Pakistan, and, and probably all three of the main political positions in Pakistan is a kind of uh, double think. In the case of the liberal elite, what that tends to be is, you know, everybody should be equal in a Western mm-hmm. democratic sense, but I refuse to pay my taxes, and if I should go to court for, let's say, criminally killing someone, I certainly don't expect the court to administer law uh, blind to my social status. And then you have the Islamist position, which is to say that Islam makes us all equal, uh, but at the same time to reject the notion that everyone has an equal say in, in saying what Islam is. And um, you know these kinds of of uh, uh, and there's, there's there's the military uh, type position, which is to say that America owes us aid, um, and America is also a a kind of enemy. And these basic tensions that you see, you know, uh, cropping up again and again in Pakistani discourse, um, make it very difficult actually to. Uh, My sweet enemy, as a title of another book put it. Well, yeah. it, in, a, in a way, it's 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 um, it's a it's a bad marriage, a sort of bad codependency relationship where America has ruined the Pakistani economy in Pakistan by imposing this war on terror and therefore owes reparations. But you know, it, it becomes a, um, and I think American involvement in Pakistan has been quite pernicious, but. Uh, but but this this unreconciled conflict, you know, are are we allies? Are we not? Mm. Makes it very difficult. I want to come on in a minute to talk about the vast impact of population growth and climate, which certainly affects Bangladesh and Pakistan in parallel ways. And it seems to be very important in this conversation. But I'd like to come back to Francis Fukuyama first because we've talked a bit about Islam, and in your um, account of the growth of political order, you argue very strongly that. In its early phases, Islam was one of the great modernizing uh, factors, uh, hitting back at at, uh, the traditional tribal and kinship grouped areas and allowing a different kind of identity to spread across a great swathe of the world. Well, that's right. If you look at the history of Arabia, there were tribes in Arabia for centuries uh, prior to the Prophet Muhammad. And his message, in a sense, was an anti-tribal one. He said that there's an ummah, a community of believers that is not based on kinship or tribe, uh, and that is what unites us. It's the faith that unites us, and that's what permitted collective action so that the Arabs suddenly burst out of uh, Arabia. They conquered the Persian Empire. They conquered most of the Mediterranean world. They got all the way up into central uh, France on the basis of something, a principle that was higher uh, than kinship. The other... I think really important Islamic uh, contribution is actually in the area of law. Mm. Uh, Today in the West, we see demands for Sharia as something very reactionary and medieval. But if you think about it, the rule of law is really about uh, legal constraints that are higher than the will of the current executive, whoever happens to be running the country. And in the history of uh, the Middle East, Sharia and the Uma, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the ulama, the scholars that interpreted the law, did in fact act as a certain break against uh, uh, arbitrary executive authority. And so when we hear calls for a return to Sharia law uh, in different parts of the world, we should be thinking a different level of the particular importance where there is no effective state law, that in many respects people are simply looking for justice and law that is going to be delivered quickly. That's if, right. if not kindly. No, that's right. I think that th- this is very important, that some of the nostalgia 
uh, is is not for Taliban type punishments, which we associate with Sharia, but actually for a law governed society in which rulers actually have to uh, obey the law. The word justice is incorporated into the Turkish Islamist Party's name, the the mm. Moroccan one, and justice in this circumstances, not redistribution. It's really uh, equality under the law, which was an ideal that I think has been lost uh, with the undermining of traditional uh, legal forms in the in the Middle East. Tamima, in, in, in your novel, you make the point that there was a, a sort of revival or a, a, a powerful wave of Islamism uh, after the war. Um, it's a very interesting uh, case, Bangladesh, because it was famously described as Kissinger as a basket case. It was going to go nowhere. It has a very, very strong sense of national pride and national identity and the flag flying everywhere on Victory Day and, and so on. Um, but it seems to me to be a country which, in some ways like Pakistan, is struggling about struggling with the true nature of its identity. Is it fundamentally uh, an Islamic area or is it fundamentally a Bengali nation? Um, and you can almost see the, the battles going on on the streets of Dhaka between sort of Western influences and English language schools on the one hand and a lot of uh, Saudi financed, I have to say, um, Islamism on the other. Exactly. I mean, Bangladeshis have been struggling with this idea, idea, question of what role does religion play in their public and political life um, ever since 1947 when they sort of voted for being part of Pakistan and then wanted to reassert their cultural identity. Um, but the thing about Bangladesh is that we've never actually voted in significant numbers for an Islamic party. And recently, um, you know, Islam was, was, was integrated into the name of the nation. So it, there was a move to call it the Islamic Republic of Bangladesh. But that's been reversed. And now we are the People's Republic of Bangladesh. So I think it's very much um, a question of trying to find um, social and political forms that integrate the, this very strong cultural identity with the fact that most people are very practicing, very devout Muslims but who don't veil. Um, some do. It's very interesting. You see on the streets, it comes and goes a bit. Um, but you would also argue that women's uh, movements and civil organisations are very strong, very powerful in Bangladesh. Exactly. The women's movement has been instrumental in ensuring that the constitution remains secular. And also microcredit, um, Muhammad Yunus's institution, um, Grameen Bank has, you know, 90% of Grameen borrowers are women. So putting money in the hands of women um, has completely changed um, women's ability to, to have a kind of empowered um, state within the village and then within the country uh, in general. Francis. You know, one thing I find quite remarkable when you compare Bangladesh and Pakistan is Bangladesh does really well on all of the human development indicators when you look at female literacy and health scores and so forth compared to Pakistan. Uh, and as you said, you know, microcredit has become a major, you know, it's, it's billions and billions of dollars. It's a substantial part of the economy. And this all happens in a country where the politics is a mess, you know, where you have these two... Well, the, the founder of the Grameen Bank is being persecuted at the moment by the Bangladeshi government. Absolutely. It's a very shameful chapter in our history at the moment because he was seen as a political threat. He has a major constituency. And if he, you know, they think if he tries to take power, then he has a very good chance of, of ousting the two kind of, um, you know, established political parties. Mm. I'd like to turn to uh, what I said earlier on, maybe the biggest issue underlying a lot of this, which is uh, population growth and climate change. And at all, even in, in your Pakistan, a hard country, you argue that that is the greatest threat to Pakistan's security and therefore the security of a large part of the world. It's not uh, the Taliban in the north. It's not necessarily even uh, American reactions or a fight with India. It's about water and people and a lack of land. In, in the long run, I mean, in the short to medium term, yes. I mean, it's the Pakistani Taliban, <clears throat> the relationship with America and so forth. Give, give, but, give us some numbers on, on the Pakistani population and what's happened to well, ag agricultural land. Uh, well, according to the estimate of the World Bank, um, unless the birth rate can be brought down much more steeply than it has been um, in recent decades, Pakistan will have a population of uh, around 335 million people by the middle of the century. And this is in a naturally arid area. Up to, from, roughly speaking... Uh, uh, about 190 million so today. a vast increase. A yeah, huge increase, in but, short but mathematically certain, unless the birth rate can be brought down. That, by the way, very much reflects the lack of female education, because if there's one you know, really strong correlation, it's that the education of women... Mm. 
brings down the birth rate. And Pakistan has absolutely terrible statistics from that point of view. And not just it has to be said because of the weakness of the state, but because of the indifference of much of and me- society. And, and meanwhile, a growing serious shortage of water. Yes. I mean, already serious in parts of the country. And once again, I mean, if things go on as they are, disastrous potentially um, in uh, 40 years or so. Now, I mean, that's not inevitable. Um, there's a huge amount that can be done. Um, Pakistan also has some of the most wasteful uses of water in South Asia, let alone in the world. Uh, but, I mean, for that, not just the state, but society needs to be able to change in certain ways. And, well, it hasn't done so, so far. Mm. And Tamima, that's again a great parallel, obviously, with with, with Pakistan, uh, with, with Bangladesh. Absolutely. Um, Dhaka is routinely said to be the first of the world's mega cities, which might have to be evacuated because of flooding and uh, water problems. Yes, and people migrate to Dhaka in the millions every year because they're essentially climate refugees from within the country. Mm, mm. Um, so, what is what would we say about the dangers for political order, Francis Fukuyama, in a s- situation where you have tribal and, 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 and kinship groupings, not particularly powerful states, and a sudden new pressure like, like that's been caused by the, the, the population explosion and the, the, the drying out of previously fertile areas. Well, I think a lot of conflicts in developing countries have actually been caused by these kinds of conflicts over resources. Uh, um, a lot of them are attributed to things like religion and ethnicity, but when it gets right down to it, uh, these become actually useful mobilizing tools for people that are fighting over things like land and water and access to you know minerals and and, and the like. Uh, so I would assume that in uh, in a country like Pakistan, uh, you're going to see you know this feeding uh, uh, a continued uh, you know growth of religious politics because again religion. You know, it, it's it's hard to know in the modern world whether when people say they're religious, they're actually genuinely religious or whether this isn't actually a form of identity uh, that is useful to politicians as a means of getting support, uh, mobilizing uh, people in favor of, you know... And perhaps, as we've said, a refuge from other forms of identity, state identity, which don't seem to be effective anymore. Well, I think this is the big failure in 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 many developing countries is it, there is no viable national identity that can be based, you know, and, and, and this is something Europeans forget because they went through many painful centuries before the democratic era in which largely authoritarian governments imposed a single language, drove out people of a different religion or identity uh, to create these homogeneous, culturally homogeneous units. And a country like Pakistan never had that history and therefore doesn't have a nation, doesn't have that sense of, of identity. I always begin to wonder whether the whole notion of the United Nations with all its flags and lines and colours as a description of the world is a hopelessly simplistic and naive one. Well, it is, and it was created by countries that had gone through this nation-building process in an earlier age uh, and could impose their norms <laughs> on you know, what sovereignty, for example, uh, you know, it was a concept that, that emerged in Europe over many centuries of of, of warfare, and then all of a sudden you say to a very weak state that has very little uh, national identity that's riven by tribal and ethnic uh, uh, conflicts, they say, okay, you're sovereign now, Uh, (laughs) you can exercise... uh, Here's here's a line drawn around you, here's a flag. That's right. You're just like us, and Uh, you're just like... But the reality is is incredible state weakness, that the state cannot uh, enforce laws uh, anywhere within its territory. Uh, and then they get represented in the United Nations as if they're all equal. This is a better description of the world than we're used to. Uh, mostly we've been talking in quite abstract terms um, about this, but in your novels, for instance, the, this is, these are arguments that are kind of fought through in very concrete terms, in terms of how people dress, where they work, do they drink whiskey or not, do they smoke dope or not, uh, the language that they use. It's a continuing daily debate, internal debate about identity, isn't it? I think so. I mean, in Pakistan, there is a, a, an ongoing debate about identity, and, and and partly because Pakistan is both, as we've described it, a, a um, very fragile place, but also because there there is enormous opportunity in Pakistan, and people are, are always trying to grasp it. So give, to give you an example of this, um, in Pakistan, it's one of the largest dairy producers, cotton producers, wheat producers in the world. 
with an incredibly inefficient agricultural system. Um, my friends, you know, work in Lahore and in, in uh, offices, shops, factories um, uh, uh, that have electricity 12 hours a day, but are still oftentimes competitive as exporters. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you see this incredibly resilient society, which for thousands of years has been invaded by invaders passing through to mm -hmm. India and has learned somehow to cope. And so, in a way, Pakistan, and also this, as, as we said, a multi-ethnic society, um, it, is, it is not like uh, Bangladesh in the sense that there, there is no majority in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And so you have this nation of minorities with very great opportunity, enormous uh, uh, difficulties. And so individuals have very different responses to it. And you know, to give you an example of this in Pakistan, there was a time when um, you both had people calling for the beheading of those who ran music shops, CD shops in places like Sawat, and a uh, openly bisexual transvestite television talk show host as your number one TV talk show host. <laughs> so, so what you wind up seeing in Pakistan really is incredible diversity. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 I think that can be a good thing, actually. It, the problem is um, when you layer this insecurity, a security-based state, over an inherently vibrant um, and diverse society, you wind up with, with enormous self-wounding. And the, the yeah. independence of Bangladesh is, is, an, is an example of that, um, of, of how a society which was very, very diverse um, because it was so insecure, so security obsessed, wound up literally cutting itself in half. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I certainly felt when I was in, in, in Dhaka in Bangladesh, I mean, this was, of course, huge poverty and, and all sorts of problems, but also one of the most colourful, friendly, in some respects enjoyable places I'd been. Yes, people are incredibly lighthearted. And when you go to Bangladesh, there really is a sense of things moving ahead. Um, people, you know, starting small businesses, um, people trying to cope with all these kind of environmental calamities and the political structure being quite weak. I mean, I wonder in Pakistan, is it possible to have leaders who are separate from the system of patronage, who try to talk about diversity, who try to talk about an idea of Pakistan that is separate from these established tropes that have been so damaging? Anatol. Well, yes, unfortunately, they're, they're all called general something or the other, um, and, um, <laughs> and they have an established trope of their own. But yes, I mean, the, the generals are separate from, from this world of kinship and, and patronage. They do run a genuinely meritocratic But they're the only people who do. Uh, well, in Karachi... Um, which is ba in many ways Karachi is an Indian city, of course, not a not a Pakistani one. There, you do have a kind of secular politics. The problem is that it's an ethnic nationalist politics, uh, which is becoming more and more mired in savage violence with other ethnicities for control of the city. So, politically, the signs are not good. But as Mohsin said, the funny thing is that when you live in Pakistan, because of this diversity, because also of this friendliness that you mentioned for, for, for Bangladesh as well. Um, because of the richness of the, the, the many different cultures there, oddly enough, it doesn't feel as bad as, you know, the, the news, the media, even our conversation sometimes makes out. Motion. This is, I think this comes from the, 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 the constant security lens through which we view Pakistan. Because if you look at Pakistan from, from different perspectives, so for example, um, in Pakistan today, there is less income inequality than there is in India. There is less absolute hunger than there is in India. Um, you know, you see uh, there there is, although of course there are 3,000 people killed in the last few years on average from terrorism, there is a homicide rate that's a tiny fraction of, of uh, South Africa or Mexico or these sorts of places. Except for driving. <laughs> yes, exactly. The driving is, the driving is, is, is often fatal. But um, uh, so, so you, you do have a very different society once you take the security lenses off. Um, it, it's a troubled society, but, but it's by no means um, uh, you know, the worst off of, of societies that we otherwise think are doing quite well. And something very important there is, as you mentioned, charity. And charity very often does come from Islam. This is a face of religion in Pakistan that, that we don't notice enough. Francis Fukuyama, it seems that from what we've been talking about, of course, in Washington there is a great debate about what should they now do about Pakistan? What should they now think about Pakistan? But one of the lessons of this is, A, that everybody is going to have to be engaged in Pakistan. We haven't even mentioned the nuclear weapons that are there. 
um, but also that it's going to be very, very difficult, nay impossible, to impose some notion of order from the outside on Pakistan or indeed on many other places in the world. Well, I think American foreign policy has learned that it's very hard to impose order even in the smallest uh, country, not to mention a, you know, a, a gigantic nation of almost 200 million people. So I think that's off the table. I think the real question for American foreign policy right now is whether continuing the war in Afghanistan is worth the, you know, the 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 creation of this horrible relationship, you know, between the United States and Pakistan that is really driven by the needs of of uh, fighting the Afghan war, because in the end, I think, as Anatole argues in his book, that's actually the much more dangerous, scary uh, place. And it's, it sounds to me like your answer to that is no, it's not worth carrying on the Afghan war, given the Well, I, I think given the prospects of actually, you know, uh, uh, militarily achieving what the United States wants to do at the moment, uh, you know, it's not very realistic. Um, Anatole? Yes, well, that, that's, that is indeed what I have been arguing. Uh, I would say that this shouldn't involve some kind of panic-stricken s- scuttle. Um, we do have a duty to try to put some kind of settlement in place in Afghanistan uh, before getting out. But certainly I, I, I think that the idea that we can dictate the future nature of Afghanistan um, while excluding influence from Pakistan and other neighbours and not negotiating with the top leadership of the Taliban it is more and more simply a fantasy. This is a, it's a painful thing to face up to, though, in a country like Britain, which has lost so many soldiers out there, never mind America and the soldiers that they've lost out there too. Motion. I think I think now may be a good time to face up to it, though, because subsequent to 9-11, I think there were two components to the reaction that brought the West into Afghanistan. One was a desire to prevent further terrorist attacks uh, on the West. But a second and very important one, I think, was a desire for, you could call it either justice or revenge, um, you know, a sort of wounded pride. Mm. And um, uh, and evidence of that is that so much of you know the hundred thousand troop presence there doesn't actually do much to prevent terrorism uh, in the West. And I think with Osama bin Laden gone, I don't think he's going to make much difference to Islamist movements or to the uh, killing that's taking place in Pakistan, which is enormous. But maybe it will make a difference to the emotional space, the emotional debate that we see in America and in the UK, and open up a, a chance to look at Afghanistan fresh and say, you know, it, is this does this make sense? Is this current policy make sense? Gliding over how it would actually happen, a withdrawal from Afghanistan, what would be the effect on Pakistan's morale if that happened? Well, I think it would be very good um, uh, uh, in in many ways. First of all, uh, the Afghan war is not purely an external war because it is partly a war uh, um, among Pashtuns and other groups of Afghans, um, and more Pashtuns live in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. So you have a very strange situation where it's it's a war external to Pakistan, but the the, the ethnic group most effective lives largely in Pakistan. Um, that state of, of semi-civil war will begin to go away, I think. Um, the danger, of course, is that it strengthens those who believe that you know sponsoring militant groups, which has been disastrous for Pakistan, um, is 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 sensible policy. And so it'll have to be counterbalanced, I think, with with the other essential component, which is which is getting India and Pakistan uh, towards mm. a peace agenda. Mm. Exactly, that. and Kashmir is cru- crucial to that. I mean, so many more resources should be diverted into fi- finding a solution for Kashmir, um, not just um, to resolve, you know, America's relationship with Pakistan, but also speaking to the global Muslim anger um, about Kashmir, which I mm. think is, is quite and serious. Is felt, and is felt in Bangladesh as well. Well, absolutely. I don't think Bangladesh has a kind of history of anti-Americanism. Um, but certainly um, Kashmir and Palestine are the two issues that um, Islamic leaders can rally many, many people around um, in Bangladesh as well. And some, at least, of the same forces uh, uh, occur in Bangladesh as do in Pakistan in terms of outside money, outside influence from Islamist groups, very often from Saudi Arabia and certainly from the Gulf. Exactly. You were talking about the Saudi-funded madrasas and educational institutions, which are cropping up a lot. And we see a lot more burqas on the streets and there are shops that you know sell Saudi burqas, which are becoming very fashionable and popular. So there is that Wh- which kind of... Which kind of burqas? They're called Saudi burqas. And oh, so, oh, I you see. Know, right. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so you can you you can look like a Saudi woman. That sounds great. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I say no more. Um, Francis Fukuyama, looking at Pakistan as the biggest problem, perhaps on America's plate in terms of foreign policy at the moment, 
what do you draw out of this discussion? What do you what do you feel you'd like to go back and say to um, uh, President Obama or whoever it might be in, in, in Washington discussing this? Uh, I think that in general we need a lot more local knowledge uh, about the way societies really uh, work. Uh, in American discussions of Pakistan, you know, so often the issue has been democracy or not democracy. Uh, we fail to see past that to the actual social structure. So I think that the reality is just as been discussed around uh, uh, this table. It's a highly feudal society. Kinship is really the, you know, one of the primary social glues that holds this place together. If you don't understand that, you don't really understand how the society works, uh, and therefore. Uh, imposing our categories, you know, as, as lenses through which to see what's going on, uh, is has, has really not so we worked terribly well. So we come back to the the old question about having a, a deeper knowledge and understanding of Pakistan, which is uh, what you are seeking to uh, achieve, Anatole, in your book. We've talked in some respects in this conversation as if Pakistan is a sort of scary place, but it should be said you spend an awful lot of time there. And would you encourage people to go there and see for themselves and to learn from Pakistan? Well, I, I wouldn't uh, advise <laughs> tourism to the Pakistani tribal areas no, um, no, no. Or, or, or even sort of long periods spent staying in, in guest houses in Peshawar. Uh, but I, I think to, to much of the country, um, you can still travel um, freely and reasonably safely. Um, I think we all agree that the driving is more of a, a actually a threat to life than the terrorism. So, yes, I mean, certainly researchers, um, and particularly researchers linked to government, simply must go there. They have a duty to do so, um, because... S so much of what is now being projected onto Pakistan by now uh, is exactly, I mean, simply through our prisms um, and is gravely inaccurate. Mostly the final word. Oh, I, think, I think that that's absolutely right. People should come uh, to see Pakistan. But the other thing which is often ignored is Pakistanis should be allowed out to see the rest of the world. When I was growing up, people would go to, my father studied in the States and in the UK, um, and that was a normal model. Many of my friends were living in the United States in 2001. Almost none of them are now. Really? Yes. The know. vast majority of my friends um, uh, who live abroad live in places like Dubai. And so when you talk about the Saudi burqa you know, replacing Levi's as the most important foreign fashion in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh, what you've also seen is, is, the, is the disconnect, the intentional um, uh, rupturing uh, of movement has left Pakistan isolated from non-Middle Eastern foreign contact. Uh, the the absolute worst um, tourism poster when they can't think of anything else to say is such and such land of contrasts. <laughs> I think we've at least shown that Pakistan would live up to that. Thank you to all my guests today. Mohsin Hamid's debut novel, Moth Smoke, has just been reissued. Tamima Anam's The Good Muslim. Anatole Levin's book on Pakistan, Hard Country. And Francis Fukuyama's The Origins of Political Order are all of them published this month and well worth reading. Francis is speaking at the South Bank Centre in London tonight as well. Next week, Afghanistan, Treason and Heroism with Sherard Cooper-Coles, Angie Hobbs and David Price-Jones. But for now, thank you and goodbye. ...for incompetence is going to have any credibility, um, then the commander of Pakistani intelligence ought to resign. Um, but nobody really thinks that's very likely. As to whether they did know, I would say the balance of probability uh, is that at least some group within Pakistani intelligence did know, yes. That's not certain, of course. Very few things are certain in Pakistan. That's one reason why it's so paranoid. Um, but I think on balance, yes. The question then becomes whether uh, it was in the hope of using him later as a bargaining counter or much more sinister if there were actually sympathisers. Mm. I'd like to come back later on to the nature of the relationship between America and Pakistan and the dangers in all of that. But just before, let's just start by, by looking at Pakistan itself because in your book um, you argue that uh, it's clearly in no way a sort of Western-style democratic state. In many ways, the state doesn't exist, barely exists for a lot of people. But that it's also very wrong to regard it as a failing state, that there are sort of fibrous, it's a fibrous toughness in Pakistan that outsiders often don't understand. So just talk us through that a little bit. Yes, fibrous is a good word because it's held together by these networks of clans headed by property-owning um, feudals, as they're called, or urban bosses. Uh, and who basically exploit the state to redistribute patronage to their kinfolk and their followers. Now, 
on the one hand, this is really one of the things that gives the, the system its toughness in the face of revolution and disintegration. On the other hand, of course, because it's based on plundering the state, it's absolutely terrible for development. You say at one point, I think, that 1% of people in Pakistan pay taxes, for instance. Yes, and it has the lowest rates of tax collection in South Asia, less than 10%. And um, at that point, the state simply does not have the resources uh, to do many of the things that the state needs to do, even before, of course, the resources that it does raise are either plundered by the elites or taken by the army, um, which is another major factor. Which is one of the very rare institutions in Pakistan, in your argument, which does work. At, it, it, at a certain level, anyway. At a certain level, it does work. I mean, it, it but partly because it gets so much money, but it does redistribute the money to its soldiers in an orderly and internally honest fashion. That's why there is this cons repeatedly this idea that the army can take over the state and run it, which is completely false. Um, and again, a lot of um, Westerners would say, well, you know, given the nature of the Taliban in the north of the country and the Pashtun er pa uh, Pathan areas of the country, and given all these madrasas, this is clearly a country which is going to fall to Islamist extremism. And again, in your book, you argue that is a profound misreading. I, well, I certainly hope so, <laughs> from, from every point of view. Yes. Um, not just that I hope my analysis was right. Uh, but one of the things about Pakistan is, unlike Iran, say, it is a very, very varied country, including from the religious aspect. There are several different kinds of Islam in Pakistan. This then also cuts across the many different ethnicities of Pakistan. And as a Lahori friend um, said to me during my researches, one of the reasons why we Pakistanis could never agree on an Islamist revolution is that we can't agree on anything. Mm, mm. Um, Mohsin, in, in, in your novels, um, including Moth Smoke, which you wrote relatively early on, um, you describe um, from the inside, it seemed to me, a lot of the world that Anatole is looking at as a journalist and a historian, the notion of incredible importance of kinship groups and knowing somebody and, and actually a country in which you are protected and helped by family and almost not at all by the state. I think that's right. Um, when the floods came last year to Pakistan, for example, uh, the state response was, was minimal. But virtually everyone I knew volunteered time, money, went out there, donated. And I'm talking about from uh, the poorest people in the market to very wealthy people. And they were helping the villages that they came from, uh, fan, friends, family, etc. There is a very powerful social safety net in the form of these patronage networks that exist in Pakistan. In your novels also, um, I was perhaps rude by saying that there's a, an element of, of Pakistani paranoia about the world, but certainly Pakistan feels surrounded by uh, enemies, and there's a lot of discussion about India among some of your, in, by some of your characters and the Indian nuclear bomb and the Pakistani nuclear bomb. But also you discuss the war with Bangladesh and the incredible importance of that to the sort of Pakistani um, self-image. Well, I think um, the 1971 uh, war in in East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh, was uh, well. It was a you know a, a terrible genocide and a, and a horrific massacre of people. Um, nothing like that has happened in Pakistan since. It's an unusual event in Pakistani history, but it does it does represent um, uh, a kind of uh, uh, turning on itself of which Pakistan and Pakistanis are capable, and it comes from a kind of paranoia. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree with the idea of paranoia. I think there is uh, a deeply entrenched doublethink in Pakistan. Tamima, um, in, in your book, The Good Muslim, um, another novel but seen from the Bangladeshi side um, of the divide. Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. No country matters more to our security and perhaps to the world's than overcrowded, nuclear-armed, Taliban-touched and, in some senses, paranoid Pakistan. That was true before the Bin Laden killing and it's true now. And today we're going to concentrate on that remarkable country with the Pakistani novelist Mohsin Hamid, famous for the reluctant fundamentalist. Another novelist, Tamina Anam, who's from Bangladesh and who's going to show us another side of the history of the region, and Francis Fukuyama, famous for the end of history, but whose new book is about the origins of political order and thus why some states work in today's world, others fail, and some are somewhere in between. But we're going to start with Anatole Levin of King's College London, who has written a fascinating new study of Pakistan called simply A Hard Country. Anatole, I have to start by asking you, uh, given your expertise on Pakistan, 
how far you think the Pakistani authorities knew about bin Laden being there and how intense the sort of mixture of embarrassment and anger subsequently has been. The embarrassment and anger are very intense, although it's a question whether it will actually lead to anything. I mean, if the argument...